You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 25 of the Book Talk Today podcast. Today, we are joined by Dr. Grace Lorden. Grace is the founding director of the Inclusion Initiative, director of the MSc in Behavioral Science, and an associate professor in Behavioral Science at London School of Economics and Political Science, otherwise known as LSE. And today, we'll be discussing her new book, Think Big, Take Small Steps, and Build the Future You Want. Grace, it's a pleasure to have you on. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And like like we were saying before we started, publication last week, I'm sure is very busy with all the, the marketing and the publicity behind the, the, the new book. And we're very thankful to have you on and to discuss the book. I find it funny sometimes how you get sent books or you read books that are pertinent to the way that you're thinking at the moment. And I found this one to be one of those. I love reading books on psychology. Some of the books that you referenced in this book are some of my favorites when it comes to behavioral science, but also psychology in a wider frame. And as someone who's made a transition over the last year or so in careers, there is definitely some information within there that I wish I'd known. (laughs) And I think is really important for anyone who's looking to make that change as well. So I think a great place to start would be to define what behavioral science is and how we can use it in order to think big. So if you came to the LSC, one of the first things you learn about behavioral science is that we believe in two different thinking styles. So one is very, very fast. You're on autopilot. It's like this reflex reaction. And the second is very, very slow and very, very deliberate. And one of the kind of estimates, the best estimates that we have of how we spend our time is 90% is in this fast mode. When we're reacting, we're not necessarily thinking. Very much different to what the economists in the LSC would believe, where they you know, really think people are weighing up costs and benefits of all choices. And then for me as a behavioral science, I really try to understand behavior through that lens and more than that I actually try to understand why people choose to be in particular occupations over others and why some people might succeed in occupations over others beyond things that have to do with their skills talent and ability so thinking about my own biases that might be holding me back but also the biases of other people that I might might encounter definitely and one of the things that you talk about in the book in reference to Daniel Kahneman's book thinking fast and slow you talked about the system one and system two brains and that's a very important concept I think I feel to understand especially when you go into the working world to understand that we aren't all rational actors Uh, so I studied politics at university and a lot of the theories are based on the idea that we are rational actors and we think in logical ways but psychology would teach you pretty much day one of psychology would teach you that we're not rational actors we are governed by the system system one like you were saying by the 90 percent yeah and I I think I think it's important to say if we get to learn by doing so like choosing your coffee in the morning or or doing things you know that, that, that you repeat you're going to be really good at doing those actually in your fast brain so it isn't it doesn't mean that you're kind of walking around messing up constantly constantly but I think it's just those moments when we're choosing the career we're going to go for when we're choosing whether or not we should go for promotion when we're choosing whether or not to you know approach somebody with a pitch that's the time that you don't want your system want to be doing the thinking for you mm. is that the difference between sort of the prefrontal and then the subconscious is that prefrontal is where all the information is coming in and then you're sort of just reacting to the world around you that's absolutely right that's absolutely right and i think you know a lot of what i'm trying to do and think, think big is to get people in the first instance to bring awareness to things in their lives mm. that they could be doing in different directions And then hopefully over the medium term, it becomes habits and it goes back into the system one and you're not necessarily conscious that you're doing those actions. Yeah. And that's what you touched upon in the first part of the book about the goal setting. I feel like a lot of the goal setting that you talk about in in the first part of the book is very much based on self-reflection. Is the concept of think big around the concept of self-reflection and prioritizing self-reflection? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that's part of it. But I think kind of more of it is about putting structures in place Mm. that will allow you not necessarily have to stay in the mode of self-reflection in the long run, which I think is really important as well. You know, um, 
as somebody who doesn't kind of journal as a habit, as somebody who finds it very, very hard, you know, to kind of, you know, make lists and do this religiously, making sure that's part of my routines, make sure that I actually do it because I know I, I know it's pretty good. So I think there'll be some listeners who are just wonderful at self-reflection. That's part of them. Mm -hmm. And I think big is almost for a different type of person who really suffer from what I call the intent action gap, where they intend to do things, but they keep messing up and they keep doing diff they keep they keep going in a different direction. And think big is really to try to put these parameters around ourselves to make sure that we do what we say we're going to do. So with the intent action gap, because I remember you talked about that in the book, what would be a behavioral science recommendation for that intent action gap? So if you can imagine, like if, if you if you if you are, are kind of reflective and look back on New Year's this year, for example, I mean hands up anybody who's quit their new year's goal by kind of you know the, the 20 20th of january and i think the biggest reason for that is that we tend to really try to overall her, overhaul our lives uh, on, on new year's eve so i'll say to you you know from now on i'm going to run 5ks a day and i'm not a natural runner or from now on i'm going to eat healthy every single day of the week and that's not something that necessarily comes co comes naturally to me either or from now on i'm going to study five hours an evening to get a new skill again it's really hard to get that time out of, out of your life and one of the, the early lessons in think big is maybe there's a different strategy for you maybe your strategy is about small steps so that you don't end up upheaving your entire life and actually in think big you know for the people who really are worried about time who really are worried about overhauling their lives i recommend this kind of 90 minute commitment essentially in the beginning where you show up for yourself and you aim for that goal that you've set in chapter two and you continue to do that regardless of whether you're enjoying the time or not until the scales fall away and it starts to get a bit easier. So for me i think one of the biggest culprits of sabotage for the intent action gap is that we really try to change ourselves do a 180 instead of standing on our tippy toes and doing things in very very small chunks mm. and you touch upon that in the book as well about expectations and I, I think a lot of that intent action gap is expectations you expect to get a lot done in a day but yes. then you you underestimate what can be achieved in a year that's the way i like to see it is as soon as you someone gets motivated myself included uh, when it when it comes to a new skill or something that i want to learn i almost you know, you, you overestimate what you can do in a day. And it's having that long-term mindset, which I think that was a, a running thread throughout this book about having a medium to long-term view. Yes. No, I mean, you know, um, it, it would be good for listeners to kind of like think back over the last five years and think about all the different things that actually changed in their life in the last five years and even write them down if they have time. And then if they do that exercise looking forward, when I do this with students at the LSC, and I give one group the looking backward exercise and the one group the looking forward exercise, it's really striking that the list looking forward are almost much, much shorter. So, you know, think about what you could actually achieve if we if we actually aim for something that we want. And, you know, I think why I'm interested in work in this book, and I think, the, you know, I think the recipe can be applied to other life goals. But why I'm interested in work is that we're spending so much time in work these days. And so many people say to me that they're miserable and that they're not happy and that they would actually like a change. So again, rather than trying to do that in a week, a month or even a year, that medium term period is sufficient to actually really overhaul your life once you have these kind of small commitments that run each mm. week. Related to that was in the goal setting part of it was the relationship between identity level goals and specific, let's say, outcome oriented goals. Because I feel like in the book, it's very much centered upon identity level change rather than outcome related. Would you agree? Yes, yes. I mean, and, and, and also, you know, when people are choosing what to aim for, I try to get them away from thinking about a particular occupation title, from thinking about a particular lifestyle and really identifying activities. So mm. asking themselves, what are the activities that I want to be doing on a day to day basis and then backing up the occupation from that? And, you know, there's two reasons why that's actually really helpful. So firstly, it kind of ensures that somebody is going to be aiming for something that they'll be happy doing, which might sound like a no brainer, but you'd be surprised at how many people end up in careers and say, look, this really wasn't for me I, I i really shouldn't show i really shouldn't have shown this but i think secondly you know i studied the fourth industrial revolution how work is changing at the moment mm -hmm. and i think being really cognizant of the skills that you have and the activities that you're good at makes you much more adaptable to these changes in the economy than somebody who simply says you know i'm a journalist or i'm a nurse 
or I'm a lecturer. I, you know, really kind of thinking about what are the different, if, if I was to break that component and that job was gone in the morning, what else can I do? And I think thankfully, lots of us have experience that we're not necessarily utilizing when we bring it into the job market. Mm, that's very interesting about the fourth way of thinking when it comes to the work, the world of work. Because I was reading uh, Daniel Susskind's book, A World Without Work. And that was very much the case about the fact that the way in which that we will approach work is going to change. And I feel like when it comes to, so I, I, my personal way of seeing goals is very much not outcome oriented because the outcome can change. It's very difficult to predict what outcome you'll get into the future because 99% of the things that happen, you, you have no idea that they were going to happen when they happened, when you, when you look back. So the only thing that you can control is your approach and your decision making, which is what you, you say in the book, is your decision making and your process is the most important thing and the thing that you're you're in control of ultimately. And I think your approach as well has a value in the sense that if you're just outcome driven, you can become quite blind to other opportunities that are at the periphery. Mm. Whereas if you're focused on the process and you're focused on decision making, you're much more likely to see other opportunities and other pivots that actually come your way. So yeah, I, I really like that. Do you think that it's because in the book you talk about mindset by Carol Dweck, do you feel like that is the difference between having an open mindset and a fixed mindset? I think it's even more than that, because I think, you know, if we think about somebody who has a an open mindset, it really or, or, or a growth mindset, it really means that they kind of believe that they can actually achieve anything but they could still be driven by the outcome. So I might still see one career label. I might still see, I might, might still see one particular, particular thing to aim for. Mm. So I think actually stressing that point that having the growth mindset, but also moving away from the outcome as a second part is actually really, really important. And I don't say it in the way that you said it in the book. I wish I'd met you beforehand, but I, I, really, I, re I really like it, you know, to move the focus away from the outcome and really focus on these processes. Yeah, because when I read that part of the book, I very much thought of Atomic Habits by James Clear. Yeah. In that book, he talks about identity level change. And I know Jordan Peterson talks about it in his books as well as moving away from an actual outcome oriented example into your own identity. And I feel like my approach has been very much identity level driven based on certain actions that I want to take in the future. It's like, OK, what does a person that I want to become act like in five to 10 years? And let's act like that now in the process of becoming that person rather than saying, oh, I want to achieve a specific, let's say title or monetary target, whatever it be, whatever it might be. Do you still find the students that you ask this at LSE are still very much fixated on a title or a level of income away apart from, let's say, the actual identity? I think so. I teach two types of students. So I teach master's students who've just come in mm. and then I teach the executive students. And you you see more in the executive students that they've moved away from the outcome. And I think usually when they have, it's because the lesson has been learned the hard way. So they've ended up in a particular job that they necessarily move away from. I still see master's students really aiming for a particular company to work for mm. or a particular title of, of a job. And I think the reason for that is that we're quite bad here, you know, in the UK and, you know, in the US. Canada, Australia, um, any developed country that might come to mind, at teaching kids about how to choose their occupations when they're young, and actually about getting kids to envision their future self in a way that's actually quite empathetic. Um, and again, there's kind of a movement towards soft skills that I really like, and um, you know, the idea that we should actually be giving these to kids in schools. And I think if we do that, then it will actually make things much easier for children going into the labour force. Mm, definitely. The more that I read about the changes in education and the changes, sorry, the changes in the world of work, I think back to my education and think about perhaps what could have been done differently. Um, and I'm sure you do the same as well in, in your line of work. One of the things I wanted to touch upon was I found a common thread throughout your book was the importance of taking personal responsibility for the things yeah. that happen around you. And I feel like through my experiences, if I hadn't taken or if I, if I don't take personal responsibility for the things that are going on in my life whether I've caused them or whether someone else has imparted them upon me you still can't find the plan in order to go forward is that a concept in behavioral science about personal responsibility and and what impact does that play on an individual Yes. So, I mean, you know, the the idea of kind of empowering somebody to action has been shown in behavioral science to help people get out of, you know, some of the most crummy situations. Specific to think big, I talk about the idea of being very reflective on how much of the kind of future that I want to build for myself is within my own control 
and how much is it that other people actually control? And I think now, for me, it's about 80-20. And I think when I was younger, it was probably about 50-50, right? So there was always something that I could actually do for myself. And the more, the further you move along in, in, in your career, the more those ratios balance in your favor. And, you know, I don't want to discount, and I, I wrote a chapter in the book about other people's cognitive biases that has two different types. It has the ones where, you know, people are just really blind. So there's kind of no underlying discrimination at play. And then I also talk about discrimination. So I definitely don't want to kind of say to people who might be feeling discriminated against that it's not real. It Mm. probably is, but I want them to be able to empower themselves to figure out a way around it. And I think I've, you know, I've tried to do that to the best of my ability in ThinkBay because I think if we get stuck particularly, you know, if we come up against people who are very negative around us and if we get stuck relying on them, which I have done in my career, actually, relying on people who've been quite negative towards me, that's when you really get stuck. And what I really want to do for readers is kind of empower them and say, okay, this person is a jerk. They're standing in my way. They're treating me badly. Let's acknowledge it as real. Now, what can I actually do to get around that? So what can I actually do to navigate myself to a different place so I can move away from them and continue my journey, which I actually deserve. So I think the personal responsibility part is really, really important. And I also think the empowerment is important, you know, particularly if you work in a, in, in a corporate company, more and more the kind of onus of your career progression is being put on the manager, which, which comes from a good place. I think it comes from a good place in these companies. But I think the, the negative spillover of that is that there's some really talented individuals kind of sitting there going, well, my manager didn't promote me this year. My manager didn't give me the pay rise. My manager isn't giving me the opportunities. And it's for those individuals that I'm kind of writing for and saying, okay, that is true. And your manager isn't a very good one. So how are you going to go, how are you going to get around it? Because you can't change him, but you can change your actions. Sure. What were some of the techniques that you used then in order to balance out your ratio from a 50-50 to an 80-20? So I think it's time in, in a sense of kind of the further you move along in your career and the more successful you are, the more is actually in your control because, you know, opportunities actually create opportunities. So I think the first place is really to kind of figure out what are the biases that are actually standing in your way still that, that, that actually belong to you. And one of the examples I actually give in the book is when I moved to LSE, I actually remember being so excited to get a job, you know, at the London School of Economics. I was always kind of quietly ambitious and, you know, I would have been due, not in, not in a way that I was accelerated, but I would have been due to become what was known as a senior lecturer at the time in two years time and you know I had this this man who was a senior professor who was a mentor of mine we got on incredibly well incredibly friendly and I remember asking him if you look at my work what do you think about me going for promotion in two years time he said no and you know it's going to be more than five years for you and I don't write about this in the book actually but he did also point out somebody and say look that's the guy who you should be kind of trying to be like And it really got me down and that became a self-fulfilling prophecy for me. It took, I think it was like, it was over two months because I read my, I read read my diaries um, to to read the book again. And I, I, I thought to myself, you know, maybe this guy isn't actually a really good mentor. And I went and I found three different people to ask the same question of and to get advice from. And that was enough to kind of push me off my plateau at the LSC. So kind of really thinking about who am I taking advice from as an individual? Who am I relying on for my career? And then also these kind of uh, these blind spots, just because I happen to like somebody doesn't necessarily mean they're the best person to give me feedback. Am I somebody who's victim of confirmation bias? So when I'm seeking advice for my career, am I talking to people who will tell me what I want to hear? Mm. Or am I talking to people who will actually stretch me? You mentioned the planning fallacy. So I talk about that in the book as well. Am I setting myself up for failure just by planning badly? And what are the behavioral science tweaks that I can actually do in order to overcome that? So I think if you really want to kind of empower yourself, it's about identifying the behavioral biases that mostly affect you either on a day-to-day basis or for big milestones and then circumventing those um, mm. and taking actions to circumvent those. I thought the, the point you made just now about the advice thing is really important because a lot of people want to have great advice, but they don't know where to go. And I find that I have a general principle that I don't take advice from anyone who hasn't done something related or equal to something that I want to do. 
that seems to have served me pretty well because I feel like sometimes you might have people who are close to you that are well-meaning but they're yeah. not perhaps the best people to be taking advice from because they're just going to tell you, yeah, you can do anything you put your, you set your mind to, which is obviously well-intentioned and from a good place. But I think most people would appreciate that that might not be true most of the time. I separate those in the book. So I, I like the idea of the hype buddies, right? So, you know, if I don't have belief in myself, one of the best things I can actually do is find somebody who will cheer me on and say, you know, you got this, you have the energy, just, you know, today was a bad day, tomorrow you're going to move forward. They're probably not the people to be talking about the actual direction that you should be moving in, but that feel good is actually good for us as humans. But then separately, we do need people who are actually going to challenge us. And one of the most interesting things that I thought about when I was um, writing Think Big is that, you know, we, we're taught a lot about how to give feedback to people at various stages of our career. We're never really taught about how to receive feedback. Mm -hmm. And more than that, how do I elicit the type of feedback that I actually need in a particular moment? And, you know, when I'm getting feedback, I don't really like somebody telling me that I'm doing everything well and these are my strengths. I really like critical feedback. That, you know, well, you know that, that somebody would say to me, look, I think you're doing okay, really great in this area, but we're going to focus on this because once you address this weakness, that's going to get you to the next level. Mm. And, I, and I really wonder if, you know, again, if we kind of think about our experience in university or experience in schools, if there's a missed opportunity not to be empowering people to ask for the type of feedback that they need. You know, I give a lot of feedback at the LSC and I can't remember the last time that a student actually came and gave me instructions on what they would really like from the feedback in a particular moment. And I would be really open to that, to be honest. And instead I give feedback that's really tailored to the average student. But, you know, what about people who are on different parts of the distribution in life? So that empowerment of, you know, the feedback that you get you shouldn't want to control the words that come out of people's mouths, but the level of crit critic that it has and on, on the particular areas that you're trying to work on, those are things that we should be asking for more often. Mm -hmm. How does someone approach getting feedback in that way? Like, how do they go about asking someone for feedback? Because getting critical feedback for most people is quite difficult. And it, I feel like it's a trained skill to ask people, for instance, I can't remember what book I read, but it said to go to the people, for instance, it might be your mum or your brother or someone close to you and ask them what do you really dislike about me? <laughs> and it's usually because it's those people that know you the best, but they're so, they, they don't want to give you that feedback because obviously they love you and, and they want to protect you, but it's almost, they, they know that. So how can someone train themselves in order to receive a negative feedback, but then turn that into a learning opportunity? So I think, you know, you've talked about kind of being focused on the outcome. And I think in life, we're too focused on the idea of something being successful and something failing. And really we don't take enough into account about what the actual, the, the process actually is. Mm. So when we think about things that happen to us on a daily basis, reflecting on how much of this was myself and how much of that was just down to bad luck, then you get to see the learning in the process which actually got you to the outcome, whether or not it's a success or whether or not it's a failure. And I think we have to adopt that same mindset to getting feedback. So I think, you know, if we found somebody who's willing to give us feedback, what well, we need to give back to them because time is really, you know, precious these days. Mm -hmm. So if someone has shown up to give you that feedback, I think we need to kind of engage in active listening, remembering that feedback isn't necessarily a democracy and it is just one data point. So for me, anytime I get feedback, I give it my all, I give it active listening. And then I will, if I, if, if, if I don't see myself in the feedback and I can't identify with the lessons, I'll ask somebody else for feedback. And again, you know, I think the, the idea of when you get into these kind of feedback circles for the person who's actually giving it, what they really want to know is that you're taking it on board. So as humans, we're happy to help people in general once our ego is satiated and we actually feel that they're listening to us. And I think that gift of active listening and thanking people for feedback even if it is particularly harsh. I don't react to feedback necessarily in the moment. So I tend to active listen. I take notes. I mean, these days, some people are asking to record me when I'm giving them feedback, which, you know, now that we've entered the world of Zoom, which is, is, is another, another option. But for me, I take detailed notes, then I wait some time and then I tackle it. And actually, even if it's negative feedback, that break between when you get it and when you actually go and kind of try to digest it, if you give yourself a bit of a respite, once the emotion is actually gone, you can go at it as something that's, that's quite clinical.
Mm. I, I feel like that's the best that's the best advice for anything that you receive whether Absolutely. it's positive or negative just give it time because <laughs> there's nothing worse than reacting to something in the moment something that I wanted to touch upon that you just did as well was time management it seems like a running theme throughout the book as well is the importance that time is a resource that is scarce for all of us and it's the most important thing what is the impact that time management has? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big person on productivity and time management with schedule blocking. And the books that I've read in the past couple of years have very much been geared towards sort of time management. And the book you, you mentioned, Make Time by Jake Knapp and John Zaretsky, which is a, which is a great, book. great book on time management. And I've read others like Deep Work and Indistractable, which are great books as well. How, what's the relationship between Think Big and productivity and, and time management? So I devote an entire chapter to time and I don't go into too much actually of the life hacks, which I think that there are, I mean, the books that you mentioned are absolutely yeah. excellent. So do, so do pick those up. But instead, what I really want to focus people on is the idea of time and consistent preferences. And, you know, I'm asked a lot about kind of the behavioral science concepts that are my favorite and it's a moving target, but that one usually gets in there because it affects me so much. So okay. it's really this idea that how we trade off time versus now versus the future is very different. We, we tend as human beings to like being happy in moments. We tend as human beings, you know, to like feeling comfortable. But then of course our future self, if, 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 we're, if, if we're trying to be ambitious and kind of aim for something that's at, kind of out of our reach at this moment in time, really needs to do some learning of new skills and really needs to get kind of some experience being outside of their comfort zone. And very often people who write lists like you describe can be very diligent to doing them on Sunday and then come Wednesday and come Thursday they'll realize oh my god I really you know I really let myself down mm -hmm. and some of it's bad planning like we touched on already but some of it is just that we get waylaid with the fact that actually we've overcommitted to work that isn't that pleasurable in the moment and as humans we seek our pleasure in the moment so the first thing that I do and think big is really to think about let's look at the week and how you're actually spending your time at the moment. So I take every reader as they are, rather than trying to kind of turn them into a superhuman planner. Mm -hmm. So let's take that week. And then from that week, let's identify three different types of activities. So the ones are the, are the ones that are kind of serving our future that you're doing already. The second are the ones that you're doing that are giving you this instant gratification. So, you know, TV watching, social media surfing, you know, online shopping, all fall into that kind of bracket. So you're mm -hmm. happy in the moment, but they're not doing much for you in the future. And then the last are these kind of activities, which I call busy work. That's not serving me and not serving anyone else. You might say, why am I even doing this? You know, I can't, I can't believe that that's sucked out so much of my time. And I get people then to identify 90 minutes in the very beginning that they can actually take from the activities that give them instant gratification, not giving up them all, but taking some time out of that. And also from those kind of time, um, the, these, this kind of busy work. And those two together, I call time sinkers. And if you're not watchful of your time, mm -hmm. we can spend too much time engaged in those activities and not enough for the future. And the reason that I chose 90 minutes is that, you know, stepping outside your comfort blanket is actually quite hard. So even people who think that they're challenging themselves on a weekly basis, if you really get to it, very often they're spending time in activities that they're actually really good at, and they do kind of have utility in the day. And then, you know, I think the focus on happiness at the moment in society means that we feel that we should be happy in every single moment of time. But of course, if I have to learn something hard, that's just not good. That's just not going to be realistic. And then the rest of the time chapter is what are the behavioral science tips and tricks that I can use to make sure that I stick to the plan of not doing these time sinkers and give my 19 minutes to building the future that I want. So I talk about things like carrots and sticks. So if you're really finding it hard, you know, showing up for something that's quite painful in the moment, why not bundle it with something that you actually enjoy? So you're giving yourself that incentive to actually carry it out. And I also talk about things like, you know, identifying the meaning in what you want to do. So again, bringing the value of, of your future self into the present day so you continue to show up for yourself in the present day when it actually comes to what is the actual thing that you should do in, in how to schedule your time and in thinking what I'm trying to do is to get people to take a small amount of time and stick to showing up for that and making it a habit yeah making it consistent and then over time it just automatically increases because you just find yourself building momentum and that's what I think a lot of it is it's just build momentum because the momentum then carries you forward yeah 
No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. And and, and and in in the ideal setting, that's what people will actually get from Think Big. You know, I was asked last week, do we need to be aware of the chapters? So, you know, it, it, I, I talk about time. I talk about resilience. I talk about my own bias. Do we always need to have them in our awareness? And I think the answer is yes, for a period of time that allows us put some things into our day that supports those domains, but mm. then I want them to be people's habits yeah. so that it doesn't always have to be so effortful. Definitely. Related to something you just said then in, in the answer, it was a wonderful answer, was delayed gratification. Yes. And the marshmallow test is a famous uh, study uh, and it's a great book by Walter Miskell. I feel like delayed gratification is one of those principles that I feel like needs to be taught more because we are, let's say, in a society, like you said, with instant gratification or happiness, which for me is a is a concept which is false in so many ways. Happiness, because happiness is obviously fleeting, whereas we all are really looking for purpose and meaning if we're going to go down the route of logotherapy. What is the value of delayed gratification? What role does it play in behavioral science, but also in, in the think big concept? I think the first thing is, 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 is I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I would love to see more focus on teaching people about delayed gratification, actually deconstructing what we actually mean by happiness. So, you know, people do talk mm. about purpose alongside happiness, happiness these days. But when you kind of get into conversations with people who, who, who are happiness economists, who I know a lot of them, it does actually feel it's more about the moment to moment happiness. I haven't seen anybody do kind of credible life life modeling of happiness. So how do I smooth my happiness over a life cycle? Like we do when we store up for pensions, right? So we think about how, how do we actually smooth our income over? So I, I, would, I would absolutely love to see that. And I think in Think Big, again, what I was really doing was, I think there's loads of books for people who can just overhaul their lives and who are really aware of delayed gratification. And I think in Think Big, what I really wanted to write for was, was people who perhaps were finding it hard to do that in the past because they do suffer from time and consistent preferences, or perhaps they find it hard because they actually have bills to pay. Delaying gratification for five years then becomes really, really difficult. Or perhaps people who are, who are risk averse, who kind of mm. you know, worry the far away, uh, far away fields are greener, which again, is kind of another way of thinking about delayed gratification, because what if the future outcome is really, really uncertain? And for me, it really comes down to doing this in a small step. If we go back to kind of the idea of, of the, the New Year's goals, the reason that they fail is that we try to do a 180 versus standing on our tippy toes. And I think the biggest lesson that behavioral science has for people who invest poorly in the future or who have uncertain outcomes in the future is that it should be about these kind of marginal, these kind of um, these steps at the margin rather than these huge life-changing goals. And, you know, I don't want people to be listening, thinking, okay, if I pick up Think Big, I'll only ever be doing 90 minutes. There's going to be lots of people who won't because once you start doing it, mm. you realize actually there's loads of time that I can grab and this is really worth my time. The, the idea behind that those initial steps being actually very, very hard, I think is really important. It's really important to say. People talk about the fact that, you know, some jobs are paid more because they have really, really crummy conditions. And in economics, we call that kind of compensating differentials because you're miserable in, in, in the particular day. Sadly, we don't have anything about that if we're trying to plan, if we're trying to plan for our future. So the best thing that we can actually do are these really, really small actions that will accumulate over time. Mm. Those small actions, I feel like, are underestimated in the present, but obviously they compound over time. And the power of compounding, I think, is an important concept that I think Absolutely. more people need to need to understand. Because if you do something every day, whether it's like you said for ninety minutes, or even if it's twenty minutes a day, yeah, over a, a long period of time, that really that really accumulates. And I like the fact that in the book you talk about computer science because that's actually a skill that I'm learning on on the side at cool. the moment. And I liked what you said just now about the fact that you might schedule time in like I do for like two hours a day. But then the other day I found myself, I was trying to create like a, like a little program when it came to like a random number generator and then you're playing against a computer and this code wasn't working. And I was so frustrated. And I said to myself, I'm not going to bed until I figure this out. <laughs> and then it was like those two hours turned into four hours, but they, they, they passed by like the click of a finger. And I yeah. think that's an important thing to remember as well is, you might set aside 90 minutes, but that might 90 minutes might turn into two hours or three yes. hours. And yeah. that's when you're another concept you talked about in the book was the concept of flow and the idea that if you're doing a task that you are engrossed in and has your full intention, that's when you know you're making 
the, the real strides towards your towards your goals. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, nobody listening would be surprised the idea that we might go out with friends and plan an hour and stay for five hours. And here we're th- kind of thinking about the idea that you might actually do an activity, you know, yours, yours is actually writing code, and you become so immersed in it that you can't actually raise your head up from it, finding that flow. And again, if we kind of think about this 90 minute block, that's kind of the minimum period, really, where you might tap into flow. So I think, you know, you're always going to go through some other kind of state of mind before you actually become, a, b- before you become a in the activity and that's really how you know you're doing what you're meant to be doing right you know and, and I find this with my job there's lots of activities really that are kind of administratively burdensome they're kind of boring and then when I get to do research and I get to kind of spend time talking about research with people like you I realize you know I'm, I'm really in I'm really in the occupation I you know I, I'm not necessarily watching the time but I will give you one life hack that might be actually helpful if you struggle to uh, if you struggle to actually show up for things so the pom- the Pomodoro technique actually yeah. suggests that you take these breaks like 15 minutes if you read behind it when you were doing that if you 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 should have taken the break because there's something about our mind that we will never we, we don't want to leave things unsolved so the chances of actually walking away from it and not coming back are really really low and this idea of having this buzzer where I get up and I walk around for five minutes is really hinged on the fact that you interrupt somebody who psychologically doesn't want to be turned away from the activity so then when you get back it feels like a blessing so you're almost kind of raising that activities mojo which I think is really cool you know so when you remember it and remember being engaged you say oh that's something that I want to do again just like meeting friends just like watching tv yeah this is something that I really enjoy. So there's actually value in purposely interrupting yourself in those states. There is, there is, particularly if you're somebody who doesn't routinely show up for activities where, where you find flow. So then kind of, if you're in the middle of something and you're so engrossed in it, you haven't finished the chapter, you haven't you know, cracked the code of the bug, just that psychology, you the next day when you're thinking about sitting down, you go, oh, I really, I really enjoy that. I find it hard to tear myself away from it. So forming memories around flow is, is helpful. That's an interesting concept though, because I've found that in the past where I've done something and I've perhaps overcommitted on one day. And then perhaps that has that fatigue has then uh, transferred itself over for the next day. And then I don't feel like doing anything, or I've convinced myself I did a lot the previous day, so I don't have to do anything today. Yeah. Is it, is it related to that concept? It is. And I mean, this is go- this is going to be personal. And I think, you know, you, you asked about self-reflection and think big, and it really is getting people to self-reflect on their working styles. You know, I'm somebody who would do much better to work for 12 hours in one particular day and take the day off the next day. But I, ha- I commit to taking the day off the next day and doing that. So I'll have a chunk of work that I want to get done. And I balance my well-being out by having that day off to kind of so so I'm not fatigued. Mm. Other people will do much better just working a nine to five or maybe it's not nine to five. Maybe it's six to ten and then you just do some work in the evening. And I think figuring that out is kind of a personal journey in itself that Mm. would allow individuals become more productive. And that's really, you know, one thing when I was writing Think Big that that I kind of stressed over and over again is that we are all individually different. So from the research, I can give you insights that worked for people in different populations but you mightn't be one of them and really testing that out again it's about kind of claiming autonomy over how you actually build your future so but figuring that out will make you be more productive but also it will allow you to keep an eye on your work-life balance because the first example that you gave happens to so many people where they'll work very long on a Monday but they feel they should show up on Tuesday in exactly the same in exactly the same capacity and that's that that's a train to burnout, which is exactly what you don't want when we're going to be working for an incredibly long time. Exactly. I, I think that you mentioned many, many good points there. I think the interesting thing for me in the self-reflection aspect was to understand for me personally on my own journey was the fact that I'm very much the type of person, and you talked about in the book, where the importance of sleep and well-being and, and these kind of things, which I feel like is becoming more of a discussion in the workplace, yeah. in the corporate world, uh, away from I remember reading a story, I forgot the the lady's name, but she was a, a CEO and she was saying about how to avoid doing Zoom meetings on Fridays. And I can't, I think it was Citibank. Yeah, that's Jane Fraser. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. That's the one, which it seems like that is more of a move away from sort of that corporate environment to more health and well-being. That has been sort of my experience of it and finding what works for you is really important. And I feel like it's important not to look at the mean in statistics and automatically yeah. assume that you fall into the mean. And that it, it is the best thing for you. I think trial trial and error. And I, you talked about it in the book about trial testing and, and then seeing what works and doesn't work. I think that's very important. 
Yes. So, I mean, if you think about, if you think about things that people tell you that, that will work, evaluate it for yourself because they're telling you based on the average, you know, psychologists in particular, I'm an economist and we're much better at, at reporting standard deviations. Psychologists tend to report the average and the significance testing, which doesn't really tell you a lot about whether it will work for people like you, but then everyone is different. And, you know, once you actually do this for a while, I think you'll end up with an arsenal of things that will actually help people become much more productive and kind of mm -hmm aim for something that that, that 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 they want to aim for but in the beginning trial and error learning is really really important for those people that like to learn a common thread that i find among people who actually take time to do things is they have a strong action bias yeah i feel like the people that i look up to personally who have either achieved a lot or they have a mindset that i enjoy is that they have a strong bias for action rather than the over planning that we talked about earlier that action bias do you feel like that is one of those things that more people need to have where's the balance between having an action bias and planning and strategy because that's something i think about quite a bit is am i over planning this am i under planning this should i just be taking that step should i wait should i delay this like having those internal monologues is i think what a lot of people struggle with so where is the balance between action planning and, and that mindset I, mean, I think the first thing people need to figure out is whether or not they suffer from anticipated loss aversion when, when, when they fail to take action. Because when we anticipate something, it's an experience in itself. So if you're somebody who fears failure or fears putting yourself out there, mm -hmm you will feel very, very negative. So you will find yourself having the conversations like you just described, you know, is it ready? Maybe you're striving for perfectionism and that's the way that you actually, you, you stop putting yourself forward. And I think as humans, we tend to overestimate the pain of failure or not doing well when we anticipate it because we underestimate our ability to bounce back and to kind of, you know, brush it off and, 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 and to, figure out a, to figure out a way forward. And I think again, if you kind of imagine somebody who doesn't overfocus necessarily on putting themselves forward, but more focuses on what are the kind of activities that I need to do to move ahead in my life? How can I get experience of those? You know, I can tell you the first time that I gave a big, really big talk at NYU, I totally bombed it. It was horrendous, but a huge learning experience in how to actually prep for that audience. So, you know, if I had my time back, would I have planned more? Yes. But do I think that I would have went on to like speak in lots of other American universities had I not done that? Probably not. You know, I made some good connections and thankfully the spotlight effect me meant that lots of people don't necessarily remember. I remember it, but lots of other people don't remember it. So again, it's really about finding that balance. I try to separate them and think big to the preparation part is the, the small steps where you're automatically actually taking actions because you're engaging in activities, you're committing to skills. Mm. And then there's these kind of points for these kind of big milestones where I talk about things like action bias I talk about planning fallacy so you know have I actually really planned but I really I really kind of try to get people to focus on when things are a failure and when they're a success let's reflect on why that actually was and in my NYU example it was definitely my fault so that meant for the next time around I didn't make that mistake and I learned something about myself whereas for somebody else maybe they totally over planned and could have actually been ready for something two or three weeks later and that post more allows them to update their time in the next time around so mm. in some ways the first few goals are try it and see which can be terrifying if you fear failure but again knowing that you'll bounce back and moving away from the labels of failure and success I think should help some people that spotlight syndrome that you talk about is a big one because you, you almost feel <laughs> like the, the, the narrative that you have is that everyone's watching you and that everyone is seeing your failures when really, if you take some time to think about it, people are so concerned about themselves and their own failures that they don't really care about you, which I feel like that, that, that perspective frees you up to then reframe whatever you're doing through a new lens. It does, it does. And I think, you know, even if somebody does notice you, once you're taking the learning out of it, just carry on. So that's the process. So again, it's moving away from kind of focusing on, did I succeed this time? Did I fail this time? Really to be reflecting on how did this process actually go? Is there something that well, I'll actually change for the next time around? Yeah, and that change, I feel like, has to come with a strong plan for yes. action. I think instead, I think what a lot of people do, and I've done this in the past, is I've done the reflection. I've done, okay, cool, these are the learning things. This is what I'm going to do differently. And then there's just, there's nothing. <laughs> and then you get to the next time doing it, and you, you think to yourself, wait, I've been here before. What do I do now? And you're sort of in that cycle. 
that's imagining this is a journey, right? So on the journey, there's going to be pit stops, there's going to be milestones and they get planned out. And regardless of whether you're ready or not, you go through the milestone, you take the action and then you reflect. And maybe there's things that you actually change for the next for, 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 for the next time that you put your hat in the ring. And, you know, every time I'm talking about something like this, I always think about pitching. And I think if you're somebody who kind of has a startup company and you're looking for funding, really kind of getting that experience of pitching is what's going to actually make you good at it. You know, so some people will be really blessed and knock it out of the park the first time, but for others, it will take learning. And that's absolutely okay too. Making your plan, you need to really set a time for when you'll go out there again so that you don't actually leave a failure, you know, hold you back. And I think it's the same with anything else that you actually might be doing, any other activities, whether it's public speaking, whether it's actually kind of getting other ways to demonstrate your skill, you put yourself out there, you get a particular rating. And as, as humans, you know, some of us are inclined to actually think things didn't go particularly well when in fact they did, which mm. which, which even surprised, knowing about these biases, as they kind of call you sophisticated in behavioral science, doesn't necessarily mean you're any better off than someone who's naive and doesn't actually know about them. You know, you might really also be a bad evaluator for yourself, but that post-mortem period allows you to get around that somewhat. Mm. I feel related to that is you always had that one person in school who was really good at exams and yeah. you know they did well, but they're like, oh, no, that didn't go very well. And then you think, so, it went really well for you. And I know it went well for you, but why do you keep on saying that it didn't? They sort of almost sort of brushing it off as saying, no, I didn't, I didn't, didn't think I did that well, which I feel like is equal to someone who's completely naive to it because you're not being perhaps true to yourself. And there might be yeah. some some cognitive dissonance anyway. It's one of the best things we can do for ourselves is become a really good judge of whether or not something that we did was quality or not. And I think, you know, if you can imagine most people in schools, they, you know, tend to grossly overestimate or underestimate how they actually got on exams. I knew lots of people like with the one you just described, they're super annoying. <laughs> but as adults, we can, we can really improve that by kind of thinking and, and ask for feedback. So, you know, some, you know, if you fail something, the pe person who's rejecting you, ask them for feedback in the moment. And again, sometimes it might be of good quality, but there could be some really good golden nuggets that have learning for you in that particular process. Yeah. And I feel like you need to take out the ego part of it, of feedback. I've actually had experiences in the past as well, when it comes to feedback, where it just becomes a tick box exercise for the individual. And I feel like this is something, for instance, when I did my grad scheme, it was very much the case of, um, okay, I have to do this because this is the process. And they sort of just go through the tick box exercise on the piece of paper where it's not actual positive is not like feedback in the sense of improving you as a worker or someone who's skilled in that field it's just a tick box exercise so I don't know how much that is the case as well in the workplace where it's not I guess that's down to the situation and the actual manager but I do feel like that's quite prevalent as well I, I, and I think this is kind of this is my big motivator for writing Think Big. It's kind of this move to these tick box process driven exercises of you know career development reviews for most of us, unless you're quite lucky and you get somebody who really takes it seriously, they're time sucking and it doesn't really giving you much back to really allowing people actually take autonomy over their own career. And when you when you spoke about ego, it really reminded me to say something that I think is so important. You know, when we're learning something for the first time, we feel really crummy about it. And that really is just our ego, because as humans, we want to be above average, right? We want to be the best kind of in, in all situations. Mm -hmm. And I think we hold ourselves back because too few of us put us in, ourselves in situations where we're in a room with people who are talking about something that we actually know nothing about. And if you really want to advance yourself, one of the best things you can actually do is be the person who's the least smart in the room, you know, be the person who is the least to contribute and ask questions in that room. And I think ultimately, when we talk about psychological safety, again, I worry that it's getting kind of this corporate flavor that it's going to end up meaning absolutely nothing. Mm. But in the best state of the world, it means that you know, you can be in a room and say, I don't know. You can be in a room and say, can you explain that for me? I'm really not necessarily understanding it. So kind of being the below average person when you're in the learning phase is actually giving you the best chance of success and giving you a comparative advantage. Mm. But we still seek out places where we feel comfortable in conversations. Mm. I almost feel like that doesn't necessarily have to be in a room per se. I feel like that is something that you can do. You can read a book, let's say that's challenging yeah. or takes you out of your comfort zone. You can take up a new skill that does that, or whether it be a language, or it could be, for instance, a podcast or a documentary. You like just immerse yourself in ideas and concepts that are way beyond your method of 
accumulating information because what you'll find is you'll get trained and you'll build up confidence and with that confidence comes esteem with that esteem comes motivation a lot of things that i get asked as well as when reading in particular is how do i keep up motivation and i feel like the motivation to read should be based on learning rather than i call it postulation but it's like oh look at what i've done and look what i've read and look how smart i am rather than actually learning something and i feel like part of that is in the corporate world where it's like look at me look what i've done look at the position i hold rather than actual something tangible i think you know i, I think sadly you know we are a status driven society and i'm hoping that we'll come away from that in the future that kind of gives us more of the world that you just described and i think the second thing as well as you know in a lot of companies to actually survive and get paid your worth, you have to be that person who says, look at me. Otherwise, nobody is going to necessarily kind of take notice of you. And what I kind of love about the way the world is going is that there's kind of movements to make making everything much more objective. So, you know, people now who are applying for jobs do tasks rather than having interviews, which we know aren't necessarily that useful. And you can imagine integrating that type of objectivity into the growth phases, uh, phases in career and then people don't necessarily have to say, look at me. Mm. Yeah, the look at me is is difficult. And I know actually when I did my grad scheme, it was very much based on tasks yeah. rather than because in an interview, I mean, you've been in many, I've been in many. It's it's a bit weird when you think about it logically. Someone's asking you questions about your previous experience, and there's no way for that individual to validate that apart from references. So Absolutely. there is an opportunity for <laughs> to color it a bit which I know is difficult if you're obviously applying for a, a job because you obviously want to get the job but for the person who's hiring it's a, it's a bit difficult so it is it is an interesting concept so I, we've touched upon many 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 topics here and and I think this book is very important for anyone who is obviously looking for a new perhaps career goal or someone who's looking for a change what recommendations would you give to an individual who is actually specifically looking for a career change. They might be, for instance, let's say, did something, I know you gave three examples in the, in the beginning of the book, is someone who perhaps has done something, they're not enjoying it, they're yeah. quote unquote successful at it, because I think there's a lot of people out there that have put themselves into a position unknowingly, they're considered to be successful in it, but they actually don't enjoy it. So what is the think big methodology for someone in, in that position? So I think it all comes back to activities. So figuring out what it is about. So even for people who hate their jobs, there'll be aspects of it that they actually like. So figuring out what are the activities in the job that you're currently doing that you would absolutely enjoy. And then also figuring out what are the type of activities that you would actually like to do more of. And then third, figuring out what's the skills that will allow you to actually be kind of credible in occupations that will allow you to engage in those activities. And I think for somebody who hates their job, you know, some people would say just just quit it take a chance and go and find something new and I think the think big kind of approach is actually even even with the name is a little bit more conservative it says identify those activities figure out other activities and if you can while you're in your job get yourself experience in moving towards the new occupation that you want to have mm. set yourself a deadline and then pull the trigger and, and go. But I think that preparation phase is really, really important because if you're miserable in work, it's also worth trying to disentangle. Is it the job or is it the culture? Because mm. sometimes it actually is the culture and the people that are around you and stuff that has nothing to do with the job. But if your answer is yes, it's the job, it's about figuring out, okay, that's absolutely fine. You know, um, unfortunately we don't have great information when we choose jobs, so that happens. But what are the things that you actually want to spend your time doing? Yeah, I think that's important to differentiate between the profession itself and the culture. Yeah. Yes. Because I feel like sometimes the culture gets to a point, and this has been my experience, where it it tars the actual job itself. And it might not it might not be the job itself or the profession, but it's just the the culture. So you have to differentiate between the two. And I think that comes back to what we've been talking about, self-reflection and and really asking yourself yourself difficult questions so like i said i think it's a wonderful discussion and and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about your book think big take small steps and build the future that you want where's the best place for people to find you so I'm on Twitter. So uh, I just started Twitter for the book. So do, do, do follow me. I have a very active uh, LinkedIn account. So also welcome there. And also I just started an Instagram account. What are your handles for Twitter and, and Instagram? So, so for Twitter, it's at Grace Lorden underscore. And then for um, Instagram, it's G.Lorden. 
and then I'm assuming it's Grace Lorden for LinkedIn. Absolutely, absolutely. Perfect. Well, then go follow her and uh, show us some support for for a new book. And if you do have any questions, then definitely reach out to her. Thank you, Grace. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time today. It has been my privilege. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more content. Also, visit our website, www.booktalktoday.com to subscribe and download the latest edition of our magazine. Join our mailing list to receive the first issue for free to get a taste for the value-packed content that we are offering. Book Talk Today, for readers, by readers.